who have come to uh, view the session today on why the cross. And as I was just about to say, during the second part of Lent in particular, we focus more on the cross, uh, the movement of Jesus to Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, Holy Week, the Last Supper, his passion and death being laid in the tomb, and then ultimately his resurrection. So it brings up the question, well, why? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Why, why, why is that even um, uh, something that, that we want to, um, to talk about? And we, we have the, the interesting thing about that, if we wanted to look up and, and find out why, um, there's very little in the creeds about it, right? That, so so in, in, the, uh, in the Apostles' Creed, for example, which uh, is in the daily office, both morning and evening, we say, um, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, or to, to hell in right one language, and on the third day he rose again. So that's all the Apostles' Creed says about the cross, that it happened, right? It doesn't even add what the Nicene Creed says. The Nicene Creed says, if you go to the Eucharist and find out what we normally would say um, in the Nicene Creed, we'd read this. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, for us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, He rose again in accordance with the Scripture. So we find out that in the Nicene Creed that for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. So it's not just the cross, but his whole incarnation and his life um, is for our salvation, right? And then he died for us, but that's all it says. That, you know, so, so in the, the two major creeds of the church, there's not a clear defined doctrine of, of why Jesus died. We just, we find out that for us, you know, so that first of all tells us, I, I swear the good news is for, for Lynn was just saying about, you know, that she had trouble with some of the theology of atonement uh, about, you know, the blood of Jesus and all that sort of thing. Well, the creeds don't tell us that we have to yeah. understand it in any particular way. It just says that, that we believe that Jesus died for us. He came for us. It was such a relief to discover that. <laughs> <laughs> However, there's been a lot of tradition within the church about, about um, why that is, right? Um, we're going to find out at the, towards the end that for the first thousand years of the church's tradition, there was a particular way of understanding that that sort of got lost in the background in the second thousand years of the church's tradition. Um, and and uh, you know, for, first of all, we have to think about what we're talking about. When, when we start talking about these, what are called theories of atonement, that atonement meaning like our being made one with God, at one moment, right? We're being made one with God. When we, when we think about those things, we always, always have to understand that all of these things are metaphorical. They are metaphors. They help us. They're, they're sort of cast be, beside a reality to help us understand it more clearly or to, to, to assist us in some way. If they don't do that, then they aren't really effective metaphors, I suppose, right? Um, but, you know, Kathy Grebe, uh, who presented for us a while ago in our Romans class, Professor Kathy Grebe, you may remember her. Uh, she has this wonderful phrase. She says, metaphors always need crutches. Metaphors always need crutches. They can't stand on their own. <laughs> you know? So any one metaphor is not going to be really um, it, it's not the only game in town. There are other ways, other facets, other ways to look at things, right? So, so metaphors always need crutches. And so all of the things that we're going to be talking about with these um, ways of looking at the atonement, uh, by the way, anytime you want to break in here, you can just stop me and, and that's great. Um, all of these metaphors 
um, are just that, they're metaphors to help us understand um, or, 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 or help us reflect like the church reflected on why Jesus died on the cross for us, right? And, and, and why the cross. Um, so no, this, go ahead. This is a fundamental question. So, I know this section is why the cross. Why the cross, so right. Are you referring to why he died on the cross for us? Why the cross? Is yeah. This why? Yeah, well, I think all of those I'm questions, surprised. all of those questions, I, all those questions would be good questions to ask, right? I mean, like the first question would be, I wanted the microphone, sorry. Okay, uh, one, we have to remind ourselves that uh, because um, we are recording this, um, we need to pass the microphone around. So, uh, so we're gonna do that when, whenever we talk. Thank you, Kel Kelsey, for reminding us about that. Kelsey, could you turn this microphone on for us so that we can, 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 uh, <laughs> can obey your call? <laughs> I think Richard wanted to say something too. Yeah, yeah, it had a uh, question. Uh, what, 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 actually, two quick questions because I might not be able to stay for the, the whole uh, session. But which uh, language uh, uses uh, hell in the uh, Apostles' Creed is one question. And then, broadly speaking, there's substitutional atonement. Uh, and and then there's the I think you already alluded to it somewhat that the entire life of Christ uh, would have been uh, an atonement and not just the the passion being uh, substitutional atonement. So uh, anyway, thank you. That's that's, uh, that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, all of these ways of looking at it. Go ahead. Um I had a question because in terms of looking at him being the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, isn't he replacing the sacrifice that the Jews did in the temple when they offered the lamb to God? He becomes the eternal lamb and that his blood sits on the mercy seat and it is the eternal sacrifice. That's what I was taught. Yes, yes. You're absolutely right. I mean, all of those are metaphorical images for trying uh, out of the history of Israel for trying to understand um, who Jesus is and, and his work on the cross and what 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 that all means. You know, to, to your point though. Um, oh, okay, go ahead. oh, I have a microphone on. Right. Um, so um, that there is there is a question about you know let's look at the. You know, you know, sometimes I, I like talking about the world behind the text when we talk about the Bible, but maybe we can talk about the world behind um, our theology too. Like what, you know, well, why did he die? Well, there, there's a historical reason, right? Um, he was a young prophet um, whose teaching um, upset the apple cart of Roman imperial theology. And so Rome didn't ask twice. You know, he was just he was just crushed, right? Um, and crucifixion was the was a, a particularly brutal way in which the Romans had for quelching any dissent. And as I often say, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was not about peace. It was about um, uh, pacification, about quieting people, stopping any dissent uh, through killing them or enslaving them or whatever it would be. Um, so the wheels of the Roman imperial power. Uh, crushed anything that you know didn't, didn't give it a second chance. You know you didn't you didn't get the chance to to say you're sorry. <laughs> you did it. That was it, right? Um, so in that sense, that is the world in which Jesus lived. And so so on one level, why the cross? Well, because his teaching upset the Roman Empire, right? So in that sense. But then the Christian Church um, said, well, if he's the Messiah, if he is in fact the Son of God, as we believe he is, how? Why would that happen, right? What, what, how do we understand that? And, and if we were to look at the at, at last week, we mentioned in Luke's gospel, um, uh, one of the resurrection stories is that the, uh, Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus with two disciples and, and they're dejected because how could this happen? How could this, we believe he's the Messiah and, and now it's all fallen apart. But Jesus walks along the road with them and he explains to them in the scriptures why the Messiah had to die. So I wish I had that, um, the transcript of that, of that conversation. 
because that would have answered a lot of questions for us, but unfortunately we don't. <laughs> we don't have the answer to that question, unfortunately. It, it was just, he explained to them. So, but I think what Luke is saying there, and that maybe reason we don't have that conversation is that it's the conversation that the church has been having for 2000 years. Um, what about the hell question that um, Oh, yes, Richard thank asked? you, yes. Um, in the uh, language of right one or the traditional language of the Episcopal Church with all the these and the thous in it, um, the, the phrase is, um, he descended to hell rather than he descended to the dead. Um, that's because in the Greek language, right, uh, what, it, what is used there is Hades, um, which is sometimes thought of as hell or the abode of the dead. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit when we get into um, the theory of, of the atonement uh, that was pretty much the church's theory of atonement for the first thousand years um, as to what, why that is the, is the metaphor. But he, is, he descends among the dead, right? He goes to the place of the dead. Um, and Hades or Sheol in Hebrew, uh, the place where the dead people are, basically. Um, you may know that in the Old Testament doesn't have a really robust understanding of life after death. It was a relatively new concept in Jesus' day. Most Jews believe that when you died, you either didn't, nothing happened, or else you went to this place of the dead, the abode of the dead, which is sort of like the Greek concept of Hades, um, just, just a place where the shades dwell, right? Um, it was only, uh, you know, uh, maybe you know, 100 or so years uh, before Jesus that the Jewish people began to have a more robust understanding of life after death. Um, and, and you see that in the book of the Maccabees, for example, uh, talks about uh, the, the martyrs living uh, after death and, be, and there will be a resurrection of the dead of the just to, to eternal life. But that's a relatively novel concept within, within later Judaism, uh, before, you know, just before the time of Jesus. Um, so that this concept of Sheol was, was prominent, but uh, in the, well, we'll, we'll get to that. And, and maybe if you, if you can't stay for the second part where we talk about that, you can always look it up on the next one, Richard. Uh, but but uh, that, that's where that comes from, right? I mean, it's not hell in the sense that we understand it, right? Like the place where, you know, Satan rules or whatever. Um, it's, uh, well, it, in a sense it is, but, but uh, we can talk about that, but, but not the place where people, bad people go. Yes, you explained it very well. Uh, it's, it, what it is, is that, uh, you know, Hades from Greek mythology would, would, would be uh, the hell in the Apostles' Creed versus a mo more of a modern, if you will, or a Christian, even medieval, uh, understanding of uh, fire and brimstone, right? You know yeah. that he that he wasn't he did, he didn't have Hieronymus Bosch in mind, maybe, <laughs> right? Or or uh, or uh, Dante, yeah. <laughs> That's why the new the newer version of the creed says he descended to the dead. It makes it less confusing to people. Yeah. Is that what they were would refer to as like the bosom of Abraham? Well, that's an interesting question too. I mean, the, the you know because because in in uh, Luke's gospel, which he has the story of of um, uh, uh, Lazarus, the poor man who's at the gate of the of the rich man, who the tradition calls Dives, the scripture doesn't give him any name, um, and maybe that's on purpose because um, he's not remembered, right? Um, um, there is this great gulf between Lazarus, who's in the bosom of Abraham, and um, the, this place wherever the rich man is. Um, and so what, what we might be seeing there is sort of a development in some of the theology of that time, maybe, of, of you know, that, that this person is being gathered up into the bosom of Abraham, awaiting the general resurrection, right? Um, because Jesus was we believe is influenced by the Pharisees who believed in the resurrection. Um, and, uh, and what by that they meant um, that there would be a day of, of a general resurrection uh, when, when all the righteous would be raised up. Um, but anyway, that's all very interesting questions. Um, so, so we've already talked about some of these metaphors, right? So lamb of God, 
um, sacrifice, blood of the sacrifice, the blood of Jesus. We already heard a song about, you know, it mu must have been the blood or, uh, or it only was the blood for me, right? Uh, one day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. It um, only was the blood for me, right? So um, that is, is, an, is a metaphor, right? And it comes out of the tradition of Israel, right? The, the sacrificial system. Um, what happens, I think, though, is, is where, what the first model of these, of, or a theory of atonement we're going to just briefly mention today, is um, the one that Richard just alluded to, um, what's sometimes referred to as penal substitutionary atonement. Those are very um, specific theological words. Let's take them one by one. Penal first, as in the penal code or the penal system, that is the legal system that um, judges people who are criminals and um, meets out punishment to them, right? Um, so, so according to this theory, you know, humanity um, as a whole, because of our sin, um, is deserving of death. And um, so therefore, um, there needs to be a punishment, right? So it's, it's based in sort of a model of retributive justice, right? Not restorative justice, but retributive justice. That there has, somebody's got to pay. <laughs> and God is angry. And God is very angry. He and is wrathful. Satisfy his wrath. Right. And so somebody has to, and in fact, you know, Bishop Tom Wright uh, in one of his books shared a story about somebody who said, to him, oh, you have to see this little video. It really talks a lot about uh, the cross and the atonement, and, and I think you would really appreciate it. Well, he, he, he appreciated the fact that, that someone had shared this with him, but he didn't really appreciate the video because at the end of the video, the, the person um, talking about this talks about all the evils in the world, you know, war and environmental degradation and murder and violence and all of these things. And then... Um, that the person says, somebody has to pay, somebody has to die. Yep. Um, and, um, and Jesus is going to be it, you know? So, so there is a sense in which um, that, that, uh, it, that there is this retribution that God has to visit on somebody. <laughs> and so he, he, he focuses it all on Jesus. Um, so as you can imagine, this, this, is, this is a metaphor of substitution, so penal, right? Substitutionary atonement, that is, Jesus substitutes for us. This is our, you know, if, as if it were a law court and we were all convicted of, of murder and we were all going to go to the electric chair and Jesus steps up and say, no, I'll, I'll do it for all of them. That's sort of the, the idea. Um, but there's, there's, you know, there's problems with it, right? Um, uh, and, and to just talk about it, it, what we're not saying is that you cannot use language of sacrifice and the blood of Jesus and all that sort of thing. That's all part of the tradition. It's part of the biblical story. But, it, but that language does not mean penal substitutionary atonement necessarily, right? Um, because the, the, the problem with that kind of theology is that it makes Jesus um, the victim of a wrathful God and, and almost uh, divine child abuse uh, that, that, you know, okay, this is, this is my son, and I'm going to kill my son um, to save somebody else, but I'm still going to kill my son. So it's, it's a, it's a, it can be a very toxic theology. Um, and, and, you know, you, there's some ways that you can reinterpret it somewhat, um, but, but it's a metaphor that tends to be toxic. Yeah, Felicia. Doesn't it say, though, that Jesus volunteers for that? He says, I'll go. Well, where, where do you see that? Because it's not really a very biblical concept, even though some people say it. You know? mm -hmm. um, people take biblical passages and, and make them fit this model. But I'm not sure it's exactly the model that the Bible uses. Now, the Bible does talk about um, Jesus self-offering, um, but it doesn't mean that he is going to, uh, he is offering himself sort of like 
as it, it, the father and the son in some sense are opposed to one another or that the, the, the father like, like is wrathful and dedicates that all, all that wrath I, it's, on him. It, it's interesting. I, I've never seen that. I mean, yeah, there, there are tons of images of a wrathful God in the Old Testament, but I've never seen that particular image as being particularly wrathful in the sense that what Adam and Eve did with the original fall put us in a place of separation and the whole sacrificial system within the Jewish faith was, an, a, mean, was a means of trying to rectify that situation. And Jesus says, well, I'll do it and that'll end the situation. And so for me, it wasn't an issue of wrath. It was an issue of him loving us enough to keep us or to reunite us. Yes, okay, so you're talking about it in terms of, of um, restoration, right? But the language that often used is not restoration, it's retribution um, in this particular model that I'm talking about, right? Um, so, so it becomes a very, it can become a very toxic theology. No, really? I was just gonna say the problem with the, that theology for me always was, I was trying to love God, and yet the picture that that gave, that substitutionary stuff, the picture of God and who God was made it impossible for me to love and worship God. And then I focused on stories like the, the uh, prodigal and, and the image of God that that gives us, and it didn't mesh. It didn't... It, it, together it wouldn't I couldn't work it out in my mind but mostly it was I can't love a god like that who would require this oh gruesome death just to make things okay I don't know I just it right. didn't and, fit and and the other thing about that is that you know Jesus forgives sins before the cross right yeah, in the gospels right, right? Uh, so it isn't as if God could not forgive sins Apart from the blood of Jesus, Jesus well, does that, right? In the prodigal, you know, the father's standing out there waiting before the son ever confesses. Right. You know, he's there with the arms open waiting. The, the, yeah. Go ahead. I have a question that possibly may be a little bit off of this subject, but I read every day and I periodically come across that Jesus is... God on earth who is he I mean is Jesus God or it's very confusing when you see that in the Bible and he's saying I am I am well who is I am yeah well you know, that that's the thing I mean that, that, that you know what what we believe in, as Christians is that Jesus is God in the flesh right so so even to separate God the Son from God the Father is is a is a it, you know it, that 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 they, there's really should be a teamwork going on here, right? Um, but the the problem I think with that kind of an image or metaphor, um, penal substitutionary atonement, is that first of all it has an image of justice that is retributive versus um, restorative, and especially in our culture where um, justice is retribution. Um, has lots of problems, especially um, for people of color. Um, this is a problematic theology, I think. Um, another is that, that it, it, um, it sort of makes the victim into a hero in some way. So victimization becomes um, a, uh, a uh, is laudatory. You know, to be a victim is a good thing in this case, right? And so, but but is that really true? Do we really want to do we really want to say that? Right? I'm not sure. Say that again. Is that the same thing as a suffering soul? Is the uh, still here, here, here. <laughs> Is that the same as the suffering soul? I know a lot of Roman Catholics feel that the suffering that they endure, it's 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 a good thing, and they're offering it up. So is that the same thing as the suffering soul? No, I, I mean I don't, I don't think so. I mean I, I think we can talk about that. I think the, the like the suffering soul is a purgatory, right? 
Um, and, and that's a whole kind of theology, which uh, is also prob highly problematic because it's almost as if I have to do more to add to what Jesus already did, right? <laughs> so that's not what we want to talk about, right? Yeah. I'm not an adherent to the penal substitutionary atonement uh, theory myself, but one thing it does is, is it uh, addresses the reality of sin in the sense, you know, that sin is not really that, I mean, sin is hurting other people and the hurt is real and terrible, you know, yeah. and really bad, you yeah. know, <laughs> and uh, there is a sense that, it, it, you know, that that really cries out. Yes. I think, I think you're, you're hitting on something, that, that the reason that this theology is emerged in the life of the churches is specifically for that kind of thing, like, right? I mean, sin can't just go, you know, um, unpunished, if you will, right? Or, or that there, or there's injustice, and that there is, in fact, a sense in which the wrath of God, it, it can be understood as the just anger of God, um, at the, the the sin of the, of the of people in the world, right? I mean that there's 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 justice that you know needs to cry out to about about you know the things that people do. Somebody should be accountable for that, right? So so there is a sense in which that's where this emerges, right? Um, but the but but we can maybe address that issue in ways different from from the way that this particular theology tries to to bring it up, because what people sometimes hear especially in, uh, this, is, this, is in, in, uh, this is a theology that emerges a lot in, in many evangelical churches, um, a, as if it were the only kind of atonement theory that you could possibly have, right? Well, you know, that's not true, because the churches had lots of atonement theories. But, but instead of John 3, 16 being right, as God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life, which is great good news, what people hear often when they, the, the toxic part of this, when they hear that is God so hated the world that he killed his only son so that a few people could be rescued from, a, from the great conflagration that's going to happen and just destroy the whole mess. That's what people hear um, when they hear this sort of theology and why it's toxic, I think. Yeah. What about when Abraham, when God told Abraham to sacrifice uh, his son Isaac? Yes, yes. Because he stops him before he actually does it. But you kind of, or I've always seen that as like a precursor to, to Christ that, no, I won't require this of you, but this is what I'm willing to do for you. That's right. There is that, the, you know, that, that. The biblical story clearly uses Old Testament imagery, right? And the history of the church has used Old Testament imagery to try to see metaphors, once again, of, um, of Jesus' death on the cross, right? Um, but but if, if we really think that through, you know, um, it, it's a father killing his son. Well, you don't have to do it, but I'll kill mine, you know? Um, I'll kill my son. Uh, and I'll pour out my whole wrath, that's, and, and the death is going to be a whole lot worse than just, you know, you being tied up and having your throat slit. <laughs> it's going to be a lot worse than that. Um, uh, I'm going to focus all of my wrath that I have for, I hate every, I hate every person in the world, and I'm going to focus all of that on you. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's a toxic theology, um, because it's not a God that, 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 um, is, is doing this out of love as much a, as retribution for injustice done to him um, and him too. It's a very, very sort of masculinist kind of approach, it seems to me. Um, and in fact, many feminist theologians um, have argued against the theology of the atonement generally because they think of it in these terms that, that you can think about the atonement in many ways in which we're gonna mention. Ravel? Of concerning if Jesus died on the cross to take our sins, who's taking them now? Because people are, you know, who's cleansing? Well, he's he's already done it um, for all time and all eternity, um, and and that that's the that's the that's the you know the, that's the theology of it, right? That that. Um, 
he did, he says it on the cross, it is finished, right? I've done it all, right? Um, uh, and that's why we can always come for forgiveness, right? Uh, and for reconciliation. Um, this particular way of looking at it, I'm not sure if it really does it, you know? Um, but, but let's look quickly at, at a couple of other ways you could look at it. This comes, this, this theology that I've just been talking about comes really out of the medieval approach of, of somebody by the name of Anselm. Um, Anselm was an Archbishop of Canterbury in the 11th century. And um, he came up with this idea because, because he read in the gospel of Mark in the 10th chapter, Jesus said, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so the question, you know, in, in the Middle Ages was, well, who did he pay the ransom to? <laughs> if it had to be a ransom for many, who, 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 does, who do you pay the ransom to, right? Okay, I get it that, that human beings, you know, are, are caught in sin and, and uh, they're, they're need, they need to be released or freed, but, but who did he pay the ransom to? Well, there were some theologians before and some who said, well, he paid the ransom to the devil because, you know, we, we are under the bondage of devil. And so, um, so in Jesus' death, he paid the ransom to the devil. Well, Anselm said, no, we, we can't really say that. How could, how could God, um, you know, that, doesn't that mean that, that the devil is one up on God, right? Um, so, so Anselm said, well, really the ransom is paid to God. Uh, and this is called satisfaction theory of atonement. Because God, it, this is, comes out of a medieval culture. Like all of these models often come from a medieval, or not from a medieval, but from, a, from various cultural places, right? Um, cultural contexts. In the cultural context of Anselm in the Middle Ages, um, you know, that the way that society worked was serfs and lords. And, um, and if you... Um, harmed, especially someone higher in the food chain than you, um, you had to make satisfaction. And there, there would be a payment for that. Um, and there was a whole like system of that, that, that uh, in ancient, um, or not ancient, but, but early medieval, like um, Viking culture, for example, that thing called the Wergild, guild rather, W-E-R-E-G-I-L-D. Um, it, it means man price. Um, so if, for example, if, if, uh, you know, um, your son gets killed on my farm uh, uh, helping out. Uh, I owe the father uh, a weir guild for that. I have to pay you for the loss of your son, right? Um, uh, or if you're a higher up and, and, and your vassals do something to offend you, your honor has to be uh, restored for that. So how are you going to pay that? Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, comes out of that same tradition. Uh, so what Anselm said was, well, how, if this is the infinite God who has been, whose honor has been offended, how are we ever going to pay that back? And he said, ah, it took the infinite God to become human, to take a, our place, um, to pay the honor of God back. So that God was, was, his honor was restored, uh, and then, then people could be uh, then restored to fellowship with God. But because Jesus um, was sinless, and he did nothing um, to deserve death, uh, and he willingly takes this on, there is a vast store of heavenly riches um, that, that his death supplied that, that, that belongs now to the church. Um, and so he saw it as part of the sacramental system of, of medieval Catholicism that um, the, the, the church could dispense this wealth to whomever it willed. So in baptism and in the sacraments, and it could withhold this wealth from whomever they wanted, right? Um, so so that's, that's, that's one of the problems with this, this theory of, of satisfaction as well. Right around the same time, there's a guy by the name of Abelard, uh, another famous theologian from the University of Paris. You know, might have heard of him with the famous story of Abelard and Heloise. Um, but Abelard said, no, that's not, not it at all. When Jesus dies on the cross, um, what we see is the love of God and, and, and the sacrificial love of Christ so clearly that we respond to that in love. 
um, that, that Jesus, uh, uh, in, in willingly sacrificing himself for us, evokes in us a desire to be so loving. And it also, you know, and, and the cross is just one example for, for Abelard of Jesus' whole life, that his, his, the example of his whole life um, causes us to want to do the same, and that the Holy Spirit will um, enliven our hearts to want to live um, upright lives and to change, perhaps even transform the whole society um, to, to reflect his kingdom. Now, we we're talking about God doing this to his son. But when we put that with or connected with the fact that it is three in one, that it's not a separate thing, even though he is, he manifested physically on earth, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they're all one. So to say he did that to his son is also to say he did it to himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not like there's this, you know, vengeful, brooding father God, I'm going to kill you kind of thing. It is, this is a necessary means of restoration so that we all might be one. And that's going back to John 17 in terms of them saying, Jesus' prayer for the unity of the church, where he says, you and me, them and me, and we as one, to make that restoration. That just proves why penal substitutionary atonement is a bad theology, because it, <laughs> it, it, does, it makes that sort of separation between, it doesn't talk about the, the working of God and human beings um, into, it, to, be, to, recon, to be reconciled. It's to... Um, punish. And once the punishment is done, then, then you can be um, maybe restored to a few of, a few of you can, can get out of jail free. Um, if, but only if you um, accept it, right? Um, so, but, but anyway, so, so the satisfaction theory um, is, is medieval, right? It comes out of that culture. So it makes total sense within that culture, right? And within the culture of medieval Roman Catholicism. Um, and then, uh, Abelard um, is a very different sort of understanding that it's, it's, that's why it's called the moral exemplar theory, right? That, that Jesus is a moral example for us, right? That, and that when we see him, we see the love that he shows us, it, it makes us want to do the same thing, right? So Jesus becomes sort of like the, the, the first martyr of many, right? The, the, uh, the, first, the first one who, who is going to be on the road for the kingdom of God and, and to, uh, to make us all want to do the same. So that's, that's the moral exemplar um, theory. Um, oh, um, there's, there's some hymns too that, that I think really uh, reflect this. Um, for example, when I survey the wondrous cross, um, let, let's take a look at that real quick. What number is that again? That's uh, 474 in the hymnal. When I survey the wondrous cross where the young prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Right? That, I, that I, when I see that, I can, how can I have pride, right? Um, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the cross of Christ my God. All the vain things that char, charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Um, were the whole realm of nature mine, but for an offering far too small, love so amazing, love divine. Um, demands my soul, my life, my all. So when I see this on the cross, when I see this happening, I have to, I, I want to do the same, right? It, he becomes a moral example for me. Um, and so that's, that would be um, a hymn that sort of reflects the, the, the moral exemplar theory. But what was the theology of the church uh, for the first thousand years? Uh, in the unbroken church, East and West, in fact, um, and which is still the theology primarily of, of Eastern Orthodoxy. Again, Bishop Tom Wright, uh, who I often quote, um, uh, was, he, he tells the story of talking to um, an Eastern Orthodox bishop, and he was trying to get at, well, what is your theory of the cross, of the, what Jesus did on the cross, the atonement? And, and he was, the, the Orthodox bishop was sort of like, 
skirting around that. He wasn't talking about that. He was only talking about the resurrection. And he talked about Jesus' uh, descent among the dead. And he talked about when Jesus ri rises from the dead. And he said, but what about the cross? And he said, ah, the cross. It is the prelude to the resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the Eastern Church, which is half of Christendom, by the way, um, doesn't dwell on many of these things as much as the Western Church has done, right? Um, and in fact, for like I say, for the first thousand years of the Church, there was there was um, something that that um, well, there was a theo theologian in the 1930s by the name of Gustav Auland, um, who's a Lutheran, and he wrote a book called Christus Victor, um, where he talked about all these theories of the atonement, but his one that he advocates is this model called Christus Victor, which means Christ the victorious, right? Um, so for, for him, um, and well, not for Rowland, for, for, for the early church, the, the idea is, well, well some, some of, the, of the early theologians talked about um, this sense of, of who you pay the ransom to, you pay the ransom to the devil, right? That, that's, the, that's the one, not, not, to, not to God. Um, so that was that some early theologians had that, but that wasn't the primary understanding of Christus Victor. The primary understanding of the, the Christ the Victor was that um, Jesus contends with the powers and the principalities, and he he fights them, um, and he uh, goes to the cross, battling them, goes down into hell, and he he opens the gates of hell and and lets all the prisoners free, um, and then he he takes them all uh, out. And so he is the victor, right? Um, and this is, this, that's, that's the theology that, that the early church um, understood, that, that, that this is a great battle that has taken place. He has already won, but we, the church, are still sort of living it out, fighting the principalities and powers behind him and, and marching out from, from this place of bondage that we were in through the sin of Adam and Eve and through all human beings. Yeah. Like the Orthodox um, Easter hymn, trampling down death with death, yes, and giving life to the dead ones in their tomb, or yes. something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling on death by death, and on those in the tombs, bestowing life. Right. That's that's what that's um, that's the Christus Victor model, right? I'm going to see if I'm going to have. Um, uh, oh, Gregory of Nyssa. Gregory of Nyssa was a great uh, uh, one of the early fathers of the church, and he used this wonderful metaphor. He says um, that, and it's not just the, now if, now let, let's go back to, let me, let me just stop just a second here. If we go back to the um, penal substitutionary atonement and even the satisfaction theory, um, and maybe even Abelard, you don't need a resurrection. All you need is the cross. <laughs> Jesus doesn't have to rise. He just has to die. <laughs> And that, and those theories, right? You don't need, you don't. He doesn't need to. But in in the Christus Victor, it's essential that he not only dies, but that he rises again. Yeah. I know when I was in a charismatic non-denominational church, they used to talk about why they only had the cross and not the crucifix in the church, and they said that it was because he got up. It's not the cross of him dying that, because many people died on the cross. It was the fact that he rose again. So they show a cross without him there, that he is victorious over death. That may be true. And, I, I, and I've heard that also uh, about why, why not a crucifix and why a cross. But that's not what you hear. In fact, I know Baptists who are now Episcopalian who say, I'm so glad I'm not a Baptist anymore because every Sunday was Good Friday. <laughs> we never got to Easter. <laughs> Um, it was all about Good Friday um, and all about the cross. And, and it might, well, while, while that was honored on, on, in, in one way, it wasn't, the, 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 the theology wasn't about the resurrection. It was about Jesus dying, right? A lot of the reason, personally, I believe that churches tend to focus on that is to keep people in a state of submission. You know, that's, that's not, that's not liturgical. It's not you know, um, it's not theology, it's oppression. Mm -hmm. If you keep a person in that state where, like you were saying, 
they could dole out the goodness of God at will, then you're beholden to whoever is on that altar in whatever position or however they feel in, in themselves. It has nothing to do with theology or about Jesus's goodness because you can't even get to that without them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more of a political thing to keep people focused on, you know, just do what I say, just head down, don't complain, suffer and take it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, versus saying, well, no, he did this for you. And regardless of what anybody else thinks, this has already happened. Enjoy it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, that, that, that some of these other theologies that, that, that focus on um, human sinfulness um, often affect the least advantage, advantaged people more than, than the more advantaged people. Because, you know, a lot of people who are in a position of needing grace um, don't need anybody to tell them that they're miserable sinners because they already know it. <laughs> Um, and, and what they need is to be told that they're beloved, <laughs> you know, anyways, um, but, but hymns, hymns for Christus Victor. Um, oh, no, I was going to talk about Gregory of Nyssa, sorry. Gregory of Nyssa has this wonderful analogy. It's um, imagine going fishing, and um, there's a, a hook and with some bait, and the fish sees the bait, and he grabs the bait, and while he's at it, he gets the hook. Gregory said, that's what Jesus' death and resurrection is all about, that, that Jesus is the bait, <laughs> and Satan saw that bait, and he grabbed it, but while he was there, he got the hook. He got, he got vanquished by, by, by taking it, that, that Satan was so um, interested in his own power and his ability and his desire to to best God, that um, he, he took the bait, and he, he went after Jesus. Uh, but what Jesus did is once, once he got down into hell, <laughs> he conquered it. He opened the gates and freed all the prisoners, and they all went stomping out. Um, and and he, he was bound up um, in, in uh, uh, Satan got bound by, by Jesus' power, and that's, that's the binding of the strong man. Um, how, about, how about a couple of hymns for that one? That's, um, well, there's lots of hymns in our, in our hymnal for that one, um, but, but a couple I'll, I'll uh, give you quickly is, is um, that would have made God an ingenious strategist. Ah, yes, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, oh, 161, the flaming banners of our king advance through his self-offering. He lived to rob death of its sting. He died eternal life to bring. Um, or 166. Um, sing my tongue the glorious battle, right? Another image of, of, of this as being a battle. Um, of the mighty conflict, sing. Tell the triumph of the victim. To his cross thy tribute bring. Jesus Christ, the world's redeemer, from the cross now reigns as king. And what do I have another one? I have 156. What's that one? Okay. Oh, yes. My very, very favorite Palm Sunday hymn. Um, ride on, ride on in majesty. Hark all the tribes, Hosanna cry. The humble beast pursues his road with palms and scattered garments strode. Ride on, ride on in majesty. In lowly pomp, ride on to die. O Christ, thy triumph now begins for captive death and conquered sin. All right, so... So that's, that's the Christus Victor model. Can, can we see some of the photographs or photographs, paintings that, that um, uh, to see some of these images too? You know, um, if we look at that, I mean, that's a typical image. That's a, that's a medieval image of, of the crucifixion. We see Mary and John um, beside Jesus. And that those two figures above are the sun and the moon, by the way, uh, personified. Um, that, that, that somehow there is in this experience some cosmic struggle going on, right? That, that even the sun and the moon uh, are involved in it. Um, go on to the next one. 
This, this one is, this is uh, Grunewald's famous uh, crucifixion, which is more graphic, right? Um, uh, of of the, the, the piercing of Jesus, the, the wounds that you, if, if we were up close to it, we would see the, the, uh, the, the marks from the scourging. Um, this is a, a famous painting showing the, the suffering, focusing on the suffering of Jesus and his passion and his death. But again, Mary and John are there as well next to him. Um, this is a, a Christus Victor image. Notice that, that Jesus has his foot on the, the serpent of the Garden of Eden and, and on the, the lion of, of Satan, that, that, uh, and he has uh, the, his, his book open from John's Gospel, Ego sum via, veritas et vida. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he's holding his cross, right? So he's not, he's no longer the victim on the cross. He's, he has now conquered us. He's holding the cross as if it's a trophy, right? Um, uh, that as the, as the, the great warrior. Um, can we go on to the next one? And this is a very standard Eastern Orthodox icon where it shows Jesus' descent among the dead and see the gates of hell are broken off and we, the, the, um, all of the shackles of the, of the dead and all the instruments of torture and violence are under Jesus' feet and along with Satan who is, has been crushed and is uh, bound. Uh, and he has the, those two people in the front of the line are Adam and Eve. And he pulls them out of the grave, bringing them uh, with him into paradise. And then all the other righteous patriarchs and matriarchs of the history of Israel following behind. Uh, so, so he takes them from the place of the dead and, and brings them uh, into, into new life with him. Um, so in the same way that he says to the good thief, um, uh, this day you will be with me in paradise. Well, that's what happens with all these folks too. This day he, they will be with him in paradise. And so that's, that uh, characterized a lot of the theology of the, of the church for, like, like I said, for around the first thousand years. Um, and that I think is, is, is a theology that, that for me is more in keeping with what, what I think the cross is all about, um, about, about Jesus being on our side, coming down through his life, through his incarnation, through his life, through his suffering, through his death. And he, he, Fights and is fighting all the powers of evil, um, and uh, he, in one sense, he has already conquered. But we all are also now part of the army uh, that that needs to continue that work in the world. So I guess, in one sense, you know, moral exemplar. Uh, but 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 this is more about having the power to do that. Uh, to it, that that his grace and power is given to us to be able to fight that battle. Um, so any other questions uh, before we, we conclude for today? Yeah. Oh, we do have one more? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this is a great one. This is, a, this is from England. This was actually from around the time of Anselm. It's a medieval manuscript from England um, who shows the Christus Victor model, right? There, there's the devil. <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, and look at one of the devils is all tied up on the on the ground, and then the other one is there like and they're coming out of his mouth. He's like holding them in his mouth, uh, and and I think Adam and Eve there, who are the first to come out there, are are running away. They <laughs> they're so glad to be out of there. It's like a burning building. They're trying to escape, and here's Jesus coming and and taking them out of there, um, uh, and and they're they're they can't wait to to. Uh, to get to freedom, right? It's wonderful. Um, also, no, notice like they're coming out of his mouth, right? One of the, the images that the early church used early, early on in the catacombs of Rome, it happened, it's, it's many instances of this in the Roman catacombs, is Jonah and the whale. Because Jesus says, remember in the gospel, there will be no sign given to this generation, but the sign of Jonah. Whereas Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so the son of man. Um, and so um, it, it, the image that the early church saw when that is that, that all, of, all of humanity is sort of in the belly of the whale, the belly of the beast, right? And, and um, needs somebody to come and get us out of there. And so that, that's that. Uh, thank you, Kelsey. I forgot that I still had, <laughs> we had that one. That's a wonderful one. I love that one. Um, yeah. So anyway. Okay. 
I don't know if there's a theory for this, but um, one of the things that um, emotionally, when I think of, uh, of the cross, I think, well, you know, God wants, tells us, you know, to be good, no matter how painful and difficult the circumstances, we live this life and there's a lot of pain and, and undeserved suffering. And God has also experienced that. And, you know, one thing I, I remember uh, hearing about in a, um, oh, an art documentary, it was mentioning that um, crucifixes, the more uh, kind of bloody and tortured the crucifix, you can tell that people at that time are suffering. You know, life is more difficult for those people and uh, because they want to know, like in the Grunwald, you know, where, which was in a hospital where people were suffering from skin diseases yes, yes, that, that's right. you know, mm -hmm. God also know, knew what, it, what it was like to have a painful skin yes. and it displayed yes. all the scourging because yes. those people were suffering from yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, that's absolutely true um, that, that, you know, any good theology of the cross <laughs> has to take into account the connection between the suffering of Jesus and our own suffering. That, 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 that what we're saying is that he came among us to live the same painful life that we also live. And he shared in that, right? Any good theology has to take that into account. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so for today, I mean, I think that's, that's, uh, that where we're going to can let it stand. What what we um, are going to do next week is we have the opportunity to hear from the wonderful Amy Peeler. Um, Amy, uh, I first encountered her on a, a couple of podcasts, and um, she's a wonderful uh, young uh, woman scholar of the New Testament. One of the few people whose um, expertise is in the letter to the Hebrews which um, focuses a lot on these questions, uh, especially questions of sacrifice and, and uh, um, uh, both, both Jesus' death, but also his resurrection and ascension uh, as being integral to the church's reflection on, on the life of Jesus and, and, and what that means for us. Um, so highly encourage you to come back next week to, to hear Amy, who is um, who's a great scholar. She's at um, Wheaton, uh, college. She's in the graduate school there um, and is an Episcopal priest in the Diocese of Chicago. Um, and uh, I, I think you'll enjoy her. I think she's a, a very uh, passionate and articulate young up-and-coming scholar. So uh, look forward to her being with us next week. Um, so here we are. And uh, again, this is, it, it, I remember the that metaphors always need crutches. So any metaphor we want to use for trying to understand this is A, always a metaphor, not, not the thing in of itself, um, uh, and B, um, never sufficient. And, and if you think about it, you know, if we're talking about um, the eternal God, right? <laughs> and, and humanity and this God's relationship with us, um, we can never know it. Well, any language is always going to be is always going to need crutches, right? It's always going to limp uh, because it's never sufficient, right, to, to the whole mystery. Um, and so, you know, we can't invoke that language of mystery, you know, blithely, like, you know, oh, well, it's a mystery. You know, so I'm going to think about it. Well, no, we, we can't think of it. We ought to think about it. We ought to grapple with it. We ought to grapple with, well, how could a good God, you know, allow his son to die? And I mean, that, those, those are all questions that, that ought to be asked, right? Um, and, in, and in that, we can maybe come to some deeper understanding. Um, but thank you all today for, for this. This is, uh, um, I think it's an important conversation because we, we sometimes have these things and we just sort of like talk about them, but we don't really <laughs> think about them, right? So, so I think it's important to, to spend some time, especially during Lent, to do that. So again, thank you all. And uh, if anybody is here uh, viewing us afterwards, um, glad you were with us. Come on back next week.